Okay. All right. So hello again. This is our next session of the, the South uh, Orange Corollary Sleep Training. Um, today we're going to be talking about circulation. Um, this is definitely going to be very information packed. Um, so definitely going to be important to just kind of pay attention and, and uh, soak up what we're going to be explaining. Um, in terms of the instructors, like once again, it's going to be uh, the system administrators. So me, William Lugene, and Luke Patterson. Um, if you guys have any questions about anything in the future, uh, please let us know. Um, okay. And for our key learning objectives, uh, we're going to be mainly talking about checking out the out slash overdue feature, um, the account, and what that means, checking in items, and then the buckles delivery slip generator, um, which is a custom function that we've kind of created within Leap. Um, with that being said, Let's go ahead and go into leak test, and we'll kind of start off with everything. So I'm going to sign in with Sora Circ again, and put in the password. There we go. And I'm going to choose Circ2 for our workstation. And there we go. All right, so let's get started. Um, first off, we're going to uh, talk about a policy for checking out. Um, so I'm going to go back here, and we're going to look at the checkout policy. Um, we're going to go to the section for verification of borrowing privileges. Um, this is a really important policy to just kind of get down. Um, home uh, first off, the home library is liable for materials its patrons borrow. Um, and libraries should verify that the patron is in good standing and request proof of a library account. Um, in order to do this, you can um, search it or be able to request proof of it by using a library card, a photo ID, a picture of the library card, or the card that's stored in the app. Um, so that's a really great way to kind of show that they have a library account at your library. Um, and then next up, when it comes to the maximum item limit policy, uh, it just notes that uh, patrons have an item limit of 50. Um, and it, um, it shouldn't be overridden. So we do have the option within Leap to override um, patrons who have more than 50 items checked out. Um, but uh, the policy states that it should never be overridden. So once they hit 50, you can't uh, check out any more items at that point. Um, so keep this in mind. These are kind of just the standard policies when it comes to checking out and making sure that uh, patrons are able to even check out for particular items. So I'm going to move on and go back to our leap test um, client and um, we're going to go ahead and talk about the next option which is uh, patron blocks so I'm going to go ahead and scan in Sally South Orange our guest patron do you need my, mine's one sided yeah I might need that if yours is mm -hmm. double sided it might be just easier yeah Maybe it's there. We go. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So once it's loaded in, uh, you're going to notice a few things that show up here. Um, we're going to kind of go over all of them in a bit. But the first thing that we're going to want to look at is this little red bar that says that the patron registration has expired. Um, in terms of expiration of accounts, this can be explained within the registration policy. So if we go over to this policy right here, um, you'll be able to see a section for expiration of privileges. Um, should be right here. And what this policy states is a few things. So uh, in terms of like how exp expiration limits would be kind of set for a library card, um, if a library card is for a resident patron, the time period for expiration is three years, versus um, when you have courtesy or library staff patrons um, they're going to have a limit of one year. Um, and this also goes for any pay patrons as well. So I believe we kind of talked about this before in previous sessions, but you kind of want to think about it in a case where um, unrestricted cards will have a three-year time limit versus restricted cards may have one-year limits. Um, so it's definitely important to kind of keep that in mind when you're creating patrons. So in this case, if we go back to Sally South Orange, We'll notice here that her patron code is an adult patron code, which means that she's an unrestricted patron. So in this case, we're going to have to um, renew her expiration date. 
So in order to do that, um, we first have to look at her ID in order to make sure that everything is kind of applicable. Um, if she's trying to renew for South Orange again, we would want to check her address to make sure that she still lives in South Orange. Um, if she still does, or if there's like a small address change, you would go to the address and change it there. Once that's been confirmed and verified, we can go ahead and renew her account. And the way to do that is you can either, one, manually change it here, but the easier option, in my opinion, is if you click the Renew button here. Uh, by clicking the Renew button, this brings up a pop-up where you can actually, it'll automatically kind of set three years for the expiration term, and um, it'll set three years after the date in which you're renewing it. So um, the expiration date will now be September 27 and 2026. Um, you can also click this button here to be able to change it if you need to. Uh, for those courtesy and pay patrons, you probably would need to change it to one, so that's a great way for you to be able to do that. Once that's all set up and we're all good to go, we can go ahead and hit continue. And now you'll notice that the expiration date is renewed. Um, it also gives pop-ups for duplicate patrons um, because of uh, the fact that they have the same phone number, so we're just going to go ahead and hit continue. And now her patron has been updated with the new expiration date and her account is renewed. Um, with that being said, I'm going to go now to checkout and we're kind of going to explain how that all works. Um, so if we go to this first tab here, usually if the patron isn't expired, um, the first tab that's going to default when you open up a patron record is this checkout tab. And um, it's kind of pretty self-explanatory what it would be used for. You're going to be using this tab in order to check out items. And um, based for considering the efficiency aspect of it, because it defaults to this, um, it's going to be helpful. You're usually going to want to pull up a patron record before you check out an item to them. So that's the reason why it does that. Um, and then there's a few things that you're going to be able to do with it. Um, first off, you have this checkout field. You can scan in any item barcode that you're going to be checking out to the patron. You can also use the find tool button. It's not usually used, but it, it um, automatically defaults to item records. You can search for it any barcodes or titles or copies that way. Um, so that's a great way to be able to do that. Um, on top of that, you also have this special loan button on the right. Uh, the special loan button can be used to give the patron more time to be able to um, have the item out. That's going to be important, for example, if a patron's on vacation. So if they're not going to be able to um, bring the item back within a specific loan period for that item, um, you can do a special loan. So the way that would work um, is if you click the special loan button, it brings up a new menu, and the loan period in this case is defaulting to seven days. If you want to increase it to, let's say, 14 days, um, you can go ahead and click that. Um, these little options here, these radio buttons, are really helpful too. So if a patron is going to check out multiple items, you can click this little radio button here that says apply to all items for this patron. That way, um, when you do the special loan period for them, it'll check out to each item and apply the new loan period to each item so that they can have it for longer. Um, the calendar widget is also really helpful if you know that maybe they're going to come back from vacation uh, by October 20th, so you can set that specifically for that date as well. Um, but that's a good way to kind of essentially customize the loan period for your patron depending on their circumstances. And then uh, it also defaults to this radio button, which means that um, it'll only apply to the one item that you scan next. Um, so it's really important to just keep this in mind. Whenever you're also uh, setting up a special loan for any item, you just want to make sure that you have all of this set up. Hit OK, and now the special loan will be applied. So when if I were to scan in an item, um, it would automatically change that loan period for it. Um, so I'm actually going to do that right now. Um, so we're just going to change this to 24 days in this case. Hit OK. You can also use the special loan for um, Jersey Cat items. When they give you a specific due date, you can just use the special loan and make it exactly that date. Mm -hmm. So, you want to yeah, that would be better. So I'm going to scan in this item with the new special loan date that we set up. And it shows up with a bunch of blocks, uh, which we're going to kind of go into how to be able to deal with that. So now that these blocks are kind of shown up, we can kind of go through them. Um, the differences between blocks is kind of a good way to differentiate what you would need to do when you see all of these. 
Um, first off, I'm going to explain hard blocks. So hard blocks can be defined by a few different categories in which you would be doing that. Um, first off, when it comes to hard blocks, you have your overdues. So if an item is overdue, um, based on a policy that we have, which I'm going to open up really quickly, if we go to the patron status policy and look at the block section, it gives you a lot of information about um, kind of how blocks are applied to a patron's account. So um, first off, when it comes to any patron, uh, if they have 10 or more items overdue, that's going to create a block. Um, so that's a really important thing to kind of remember when it comes to the policy. Um, the second thing is if a patron has an item long overdue, and that's kind of denoted as um, if they still have the item 45 days after the due date, then that automatically changes into a long overdue. That will also create a block. Um, and that's kind of how you would do it when it comes to overdue items. So if we go back to Sally South Orange, you'll notice that um, she not only has over 11 overdue items, she also has one of those items being long overdue. So that's why um, this pop-up is showing up where it's blocked. Um, if we go back to patron status, sorry, um, there's a few other things that can happen as well. Um, there's also the fees that can accrue on a patron's account. And based on our policy, if the patron has an unrestricted card, so in this case, Sally has um, an adult patron card, so it's unrestricted. If the account totals to be $10 or more, then that'll also block her account. If it's a restricted card, so if it's a courtesy or pay card, they have um, an even stricter restriction with um, their account totaling $5 or more, then it will create a block. Um, and it's also really important to look at this recommendation when it comes to everything. Um, even though it's possible to click yes to still check out to block patrons, uh, staff should it. So it also goes back to the aspect of overriding things. Based on the policy, you do have the ability to like overwrite in the system, but you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and the reason why I state kind of hard blocks is that um, when it comes to any of these blocks that are applied on a patron's account, we can't check out the, to them until they deal with any of these um, until they deal with all of these different blocks that are applied to their account. Um, I think I forgot to mention lost items, but that's there too. Gotcha. Um, lost items is also available too as a hard block, so if they end up losing any items, um, they would have to deal with that as well in order to get access to their account. Um, next up you have the soft blocks, however. So the difference between a hard block and a soft block is if there's a soft block on the patron's account, they still have access to be able to um, check out or use their account in any way. The only di difference is that the soft block is usually for the staff instead, so it's trying to tell you something that's um, applied to the patron's account. Um, this would include, so if a patron has a hold, it creates a soft block, and um, you can see that right here where it says patron has one held item at registered branch of South Orange Public Library. Um, that's just there so that it can let the staff member know that, hey, Sally has a held item here at the library. Um, in that case, even though this shows up, we can still go ahead and continue and check it out um, if she uh, so chooses to do so, or if the staff member chooses to do so. Um, and then the next step, you have fines as well. So going back to what we said in the policy, um, it's only if it's over $10 or over $5. So if Sally, for example, had a $7 fine on her account, they can still be able to check out patrons, um, it's trying to check out patrons, check out items to that account. Um, so that's a really helpful thing to kind of remember as well. But it still will show up as um, a block here, just letting the patron know that they owe money. Um, so at that point, you can ask them if they want to pay it off. If they don't, then they can still have the ability to check out if it's under $10 for an uh, unrestricted card or under $5 for a, uh, a restricted card. Um, so with that being said, we're just going to go ahead and click continue for training purposes in this case. Yep. Um, they already have that item on hold. Mm -hmm. So, no problem. <laughs> so, uh, with that being said, for the purpose of the training, we're going to go ahead and hit continue, and that'll check out the item that I recently just scanned before.
but we're only clicking continue because we're training you. Normally, you would never click continue on a patron like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, next up, we're going to talk about um, item blocks. And the way that we can look at item blocks is based on the contents of things. So I'm going to scan in this item really quickly. Thank you. Um, you're checking out though. Oh, I'm checking it out too, I'm sorry. Yeah, stay and check out and yeah, you'll see. Gotcha. So we're going to check out this item to Sally in this case. Um, if I scan in this item really quickly. There we go. You'll notice that this little pop-up shows up and this is what's called an item block. Um, when it comes to item blocks, this is something that you can do within an item record where you can add notes um, and kind of define and um, explain or bring up a pop-up for any staff member that checks out that item for a patron. So in this case, we have the item um, getting permission how to license and clear copyrighted materials online and off. Um, this is a book, but it also includes a DVD with inside of the book. So this is a little pop-up that shows up so that once the staff member is checking it out to the patron, they can make sure before they give it to them that there's a disc included. Um, so that's a really important feature to help aid the staff member in making sure that the patron is getting the correct materials that they need from the item they're checking out. Um, so that's a really cool option. Um, in terms of getting to it and looking at it, we can actually look at the item record here by pressing this button. Um, and from there, it'll bring us to the item record and if we go to details, I believe, or blocks and notes, I'm sorry, um, you'll notice here that there's a free text block for disk included here. So that's where you would be able to type that in for any future item records. Um, if we go back and hit close. Um, but just note, you would add, if, if something that claimed to be there was not there, you would want to add a note to that blocks and notes field. And mm -hmm. we're going to get into how you add a note and you know, detailing your initials, your your library name, and all that. Mm -hmm. um, typically, that's what you do with notes. But um, you would want to note, you know, received without disk or something. You would note that in that same field where that note is on the contents. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna close out this item record. It'll bring me back here. Um, um, when it comes to this as well, if the disk isn't included, you can also just ask the patron if they still want to receive the item even though it's an incomplete item. But again, like Margaret just said, you would go into the item record and make note of the fact that the, the disc isn't included in that item. So for the future, um, if the patron brings it back um, and it's not there, then it, it'll be known that it's not the patron's fault at that point. So I'm going to go ahead and hit continue, and then we'll check it out to this patron, because we technically checked the item and the disc is included. And now it's checked out to them. Um, Next up, we have holds, and we're just going to touch upon them, be, to touch upon this because the next session we're going to go more in depth with it. But holds um, has a policy in the request policy. So if we go ahead and click here, um, we can go to the declining request section. And what this explains is that if a patron finds it on the shelf and it has a pending hold, decline to fill the request, but be sure to reactivate it. The reason why this has been set up is we don't want to essentially stop patrons from getting any hold requests um, or stop a patron from receiving an item because they're like in a long there's a long queue list for an item uh, let's say for example lessons in chemistry has a really long queue list um, if the patron were to find the physical copy of the item before it was put on the hold shelf um, they can be able to check that out immediately um, um, that's going to be helpful so that uh, we don't stop the patron from essentially um, being able to check it out because maybe there's like a hundred other patrons waiting for it um, so it's a really important thing to remember when it comes to that. Once you do check it out, um, you just have to re reactivate it again. So the um, item will be put back into the queue list and the other patrons will be able to get it um, based on the queue list that's set up there. Um, so that's kind of a really important thing to remember. It helps patrons of your library have access to your materials first if they're actually in the library too. So, um, so that's how you would be able to do that. Um, next up, we have damages. So when I think it, we'll get to a point where we show declining and reactivating holds at some point. Yeah. So you'll see that. Mm -hmm. um, next up, we have damages on an item. So I'm going to go ahead and try to check this out to Sally. And 
the same item block shows up here but it's a little bit different so you'll notice here that it says binding loose in front we have the um, abbreviation for Sora for South Orange the date in which it was made and then the initials of Margaret who created this um, this item block note and what this essentially does is it does a similar thing to the item block that we showed before in this case you would want to verify that there is no more damage noted than what was here um, and then you would give it to the patron at that point um, based on if they want it or not so in this case the garden of small beginnings has a binding loose in front um, and you want to just make sure that the item reflects the fact that the binding is loose in the front. Um, this is kind of minimal damage, so you can talk to the patron and ask them if they still want it. And if they do want it, they would go ahead and take it. Um, in terms of any other damage, you would just need to note it similar to what we were saying before. If there's any changes to the damage, you would go click into the item record and then add that note into the free text block on the item record. Um, with this case as well, we're going to do an example in which um, we did get the item and there's actually more damage than we thought. So if I go ahead and click into the item record here. Um, you're just going to continue. You have, a, you, know, you have a separate example for the next one. Oh, okay, gotcha. So I'm going to go ahead and continue to check it out and then we'll kind of explain how that can be done with this next item record. Um, so here we have a DVD for a man called Otto and while we were checking out we noticed that hey the, the cover was torn on that DVD so in this case you would be able to um, you would have to define a note that the case of the item was damaged um, if we go ahead and go into the PNP manual again there's a policy for damaged incomplete and or mislinked materials which will explain this further um, so there's a few things that are kind of noted within this policy uh, damaged items when it comes to those um, which when it comes to this policy which is right here um, acceptable level of wear and tear is expected slash um, kind of defined by the material condition chart so you'll see here there's this chart that essentially can help you with defining whether or not uh, an item is completely damaged or not so like um, if it's a normal wear and tear sort of issue um, and the jacket may have been have wear then that can give you an example of what the condition is versus if like the pages are missing and they're ripped out then that's an example of a poor uh, material condition um, so that's how you can kind of use that to define it um, if it's the only item in buckles and you notice that the item is damaged and it's the only item in buckles even if the damage is very bad you would still have to offer it to the patron the reason for that is um, considering the fact that we don't have any other copies if it's the only item and it's damaged, um, the patron would still, you would still offer it as that's the only way for them to be able to get it. Um, the patron does have the option to decline it, obviously, but um, that would be the only way to kind of help them when it comes to that. Um, the policy is currently being revised to remove reference to the drop down menus. Um, we don't have that existing. We were still working on that, but um, that's going to be removed so we wouldn't worry about that. And um, in this case, for now, we're going to put the notes into the free text block. So, um, if we go back to the item, we're going to go to the man called Otto, uh, open up the item record, and we're going to go to the blocks and notes tab. Once we're inside of it, um, we're going to go to the free text block um, and type in the issue that was going on with it. So, in this case, the cover was torn, so I'm going to type in cover torn. And then from there, I'm going to add uh, the library code, the date, and then my staff initials. So in this case, we're going to put Sora. Today's uh, September 27th, where I noticed it, 2023. And then I'm going to type in WL as the free text block there. Um, once that's set up, um, if there are already notes there, you can hit enter and put them below as well to make sure that you have multiple notes. Um, but in this case, this is the only one. So I'm going to go ahead and hit the save button to update that item record. So in some cases, you'll have like 19 discs and you need to say the disc was scratched. So you just hit enter, go below the contents note and um, type in, you know, disc eight scratched or something. Mm -hmm. And um, the next time any staff member would scan in this item, it's going to now bring up that item block that we just created in there. 
Um, and now it has all of our information so that they can use that as a reference if they need to ever talk about how that damage was applied to the item. Um, another thing that we're just going to explain that's specific to it, um, to items, is that um, there's a status that for specific items that are going to be applied to the Sora items uh, moving forward. Um, all SORA items will be linked with the status of in storage until December. Um, they need to be checked in first before they can be checked out. And the reason that we um, kind of set the status for you guys is because um, what it'll do is it'll help other patrons within the consortium from being able to place hold requests on your items. Um, and that's going to be really helpful to make sure that it's not, we, uh, you guys can still kind of learn and practice and get an understanding of the ILS before we open it up to more patrons within the consortium. Um, so that's a really important thing to remember. If and you I think we're going to go within storage probably after December as well. I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to end in December, but basically the, the point is while everything's in storage, you do need to check the item in and then check it out. Yeah. Um, so now that that's done, uh, since we have all these items checked out, you'll notice that this the red button in the corner changed from closed to complete. So from that point, you can go ahead and click the complete button. And um, if I go ahead and do that, you'll notice that a receipt comes here. Um, we're going to change the destination here to be our receipt printer. And it's going to look like this. Um, now, this is going to be a little different because uh, currently I'm using Google Chrome. But we're going to recommend that you use Firefox in the future when it comes to using Leap. Um, <laughs> and the way to be able to do that is um, we, we're going to kind of show how we would want to get the, the margins on the receipt printer looking so that it can look proper when we give it to the patron. So if I go ahead and click more settings, um, there's a few settings that you want to set up. You want to change your margins and make them a custom margin. Um, in this case, we're going to make the top of the margin at zero inches and then the sides of the margin at both 0 0.1, 0 0.15. I think you can type it in if it's not easy to drag. Yeah. There we go. Oh, I hit enter too quickly. You hit enter. <laughs> but that's what the receipt is going to look like. Um, it'll come out just like this. And then you can go ahead and either give that to the patron. Uh, I think we said before in patron services as well that we also have e-receipts. Um, so if the patron has e-receipts applied to their account, um, you won't need to give them the um, receipt if they don't want to, because it'll be sent to their email. Is there a way to like, default the printer to have those margins, or do you need to do that every single You're time? You're not going to need to do it every single time. What I've noticed is the first time you do it, it, it. it saves it, and it continues to do that. If it doesn't do that for some reason, go ahead and thaw the computer mm -hmm. and do a, a checkout, a random checkout, just to get a receipt to print, set up the margin that time, and then uh, refreeze the computer. Then mm -hmm. it'll it'll work that way. But you guys don't have deep freeze on your public computers, or do you? Only public Okay. So if yeah, if you don't have what am I saying public on your staff computers? Staff computers. Staff. Yeah, if you don't have deep freeze on your staff computers, it won't be an issue. For but for these two machines here, the buckles ones, um, you will have to thaw it and freeze it again if it, if it doesn't work yeah. initially when you set it up for the next time. Is there a setting on there now um, where you can just print out what's needed as opposed to the blank part of the receipt? Because we've been trying to yes. save it that now in DLC. Because the footer, right? Um, printed the footer. Yes. Yeah. What, like what we, he hit enter too quickly. <laughs> so um, on the outline, you might you might have this on your outline. I don't know if I had updated. Yeah, there were some check headers and footers. Oh. Yeah, uncheck yeah. headers yeah. and footers. Yeah. And uh, print backgrounds should be checked. So okay. yeah, that that will ensure yeah. that it cuts it off a little sooner okay. than wasting yeah, all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Hundred. 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 But yeah. Good. Yeah, you were mentioning e-receipts, and that's important too. Yeah, um, e-receipts are going to be really important for the patron that if they do get those e-receipts onto their email, you would just ask them if they want the print receipt as well. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Yeah, I can't tell you how many patrons, um, when I work on weekends, don't take the receipt. So you always ask. Mm -hmm. um, next up, we have um, book clubs. 
So in terms of explaining what the book club, um, how you would get that kind of set up, if we go to the request policy again, there's a section for uh, bulk requests. And what that essentially explains is that items must be checked out within four days to either the book club card or the book club members card. They can be checked out temporarily to the book club card and then checked out to the patrons card when they come in. Um, a pop-up might occur for book club holds, but check out to book club member anyway if that's the library's policy. So um, essentially what this means is that when it comes to book clubs, uh, there's two different ways that you can kind of set it up. Uh, you have the first option where you can create a book club card for the patrons that are in, within that book club. And then from there, you can check out any items to that book club card. Um, you also have the other option of checking out to a specific member within that book club on their account. Um, and you just it's based on every library what their preference is when it comes to this. Um, so it would be up to you just to kind of decide what the policy is on that. But um, overall, when it comes to that, you just want to be attentive to um, the fact that they would need to have that item be checked out within four days. And um, if any other duplicate requests show up because it was already on the book club card and then you were going to put give it to a member of that book club, um, you would just have to go ahead and um, kind of go through those pop-ups that show up there. Um, but yeah, it's no problem to check it out to the book club card temporarily. Mm -hmm. And then when the patron comes in, you just check it out to them. It'll just transfer it from one record to the other. Mm -hmm. um, with that being said, I'm just going to bring this back up. And uh, Luke is going to go ahead and talk about this next tab, which is out slash overdue. Okay, so next tab, out and overdue. Um, we're under Sally's account. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is auto renewals. Um, so auto renewals occur three days before the due date for eligible items, um, and it's only attempted once. There's a few reasons why this uh, might not occur. Um, one is that the patron's blocked. Two, if the patron's going to expire before the items would be due, uh, the renewal limit has been reached. Uh, there's a pending hold on the title. So in the policies on renewals, um, it's important to keep in mind that if an item doesn't automatically renew, um, all libraries must honor renewal requests, except when there has been, um, I mean, when there are outstanding requests, the renewal limit has been reached, or the card is blocked. Um, there are some ways you can get around it in the system. Uh, the obvious one is like check it in and check it back out to them. Um, so obviously that's not permitted. Um, also, you could get around it by resetting the due date, which isn't permitted either uh, for other libraries materials when the renewal limit has been reached. Um, in terms of uh, renew versus uh, reset the due date in the PNP, um, the difference, uh, so first with renew renewal limits, um, they should, again, not be overridden except by the owning library uh, or if you have their permission. And then due dates cannot be reset for other libraries' materials. Um, for overriding the renewal limit, um, that's a permission setting. So only staff um, that are designated by the director to have those credentials are able to override renewal limits. So I'm going to go back into Sally's account, and we're going to do a renewal. Um, so you can see here she has uh, 16 items out, and 11 are overdue. So we're going to renew the tail of Emily Winsnap. And you can see I just kind of scrolled down. I didn't see it. So you can always filter. Um, you can always use this filter in a lot of areas of Leap. So I just typed Emily, and it comes up if you don't want to, if you're looking for something. That's just kind of a quick cheat code. OK, so um, we're going to select the item here. And um, you can see when I highlight um, any item in the list, 
all these gray boxes then become um, actionable and clickable. So um, I'm just going to select it and click Renew. And um, we have an error with the receipt with the formatting, but I think that's um, might have been something with the setup. So um, that shouldn't come up. Uh, next, we're going to reset the due date for Garden of Small Beginnings. And does, this is just what I do. I'll just type Garden, and it comes right up. Um, so we're going to click that and click Reset Due Date. And uh, this calendar widget pops up. And um, we're going to do uh, this date. OK, and now it says the item is blocked. Um, this is what Will was going over, um, that uh, the large print edition for this copy, um, the binding is loose in the front. It was noted by Margaret uh, from South Orange on um, August 13th. So I'm going to check the item. And if it's still you know, the same level, I'm going to make it continue. OK, so that, that item due date has been reset. Now I'm going to show you guys how to um, estimate the fines. So this is really useful if um, you know you can see in Sally's case she has 11 overdue items, and she might be like, "Oh my goodness, like what? What am I looking at? What's going to go on here with my fines when I, these are all brought back?" So how estimating fines work is it's kind of all at once. So um, what it does is you just click it and it will show. Um, this list itemized of every uh, fine. So first, in the top date here, it will show um, the total estimated fines that's made up of every single individual fine here. And you can scroll through. And you can even see um, items like the triple hoax, the blue beard room, um, and the fire dragon Like, don't have fines because they're not going to be fine. So it, it, this will show everything in the account and the total. Um, then what you can do is you can select a date, um, just for like fun. Let's do the 2024. So they're going to be all a year. Now you can see it popped up to $75. Um, but based on this date, um, it will. Um, let me do one a little closer. So November 30th, select date. Oops. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to do one a little bit closer. So you see now on this date, um, October 30th, it dropped down to 60. So based on the date you select, it will give you a breakdown of everything. And this is really useful for patrons that are kind of, they might call in and say, hey, can you let me know um, my estimate? I have a quick question. Sorry to go back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm the only one. What's the difference between renewing and resetting the due date? Like if that, does resetting it make it eligible for an auto renewal again? Is it like, wipe it? like I don't know the difference. No, um, resetting the due date doesn't take up a renewal. Yeah. Um, renewing takes up one of your renewals. So if you have a renewal limit of three, um, resetting the due date doesn't affect that renewal limit. But renewing gives you the same loan period again, however many days from that date. Yeah. It's an automatic time frame, whereas resetting, you can pick customize. any date okay. you customize. Well, it's just a difference between the two. Yeah. Okay. Is there a maximum amount of time you can reset it for? I mean, it's you can only no. do it with your materials, but and I don't. Know yeah, there's no limit on resetting the due date. Excuse me, um, on resetting the due date, but um, you can only the only restriction on it is you can only reset the due date if the item hasn't come up due yet. The minute it becomes overdue, you no longer have access okay. to resetting the due date. Okay. All right, um, next up, we're going to uh, make a claim. And we discussed this in, I believe, patron services training. But um, there might be a time where um, there is you know, confusion on, on, on a, say, a lost item. Um, Sally could say, hey, I returned it, and it just never got um, checked in, and it's at the library. Or it could be um, something she said, hey, I never checked out. So I'm just going to um, make a claim. And before I do that, I'll go into, uh, let me just get to the, uh, 
uh, this part of the slide um, for our links here. So um, claims return claim never had policy. So uh, if there's ever uh, a disagreement with the patron and the what the system or library says in terms of um, a nine number was returned or they never had it, um, it's important to remember that this is only determined by the owning library. Uh, so you can't kind of um, you know answer for another library's item. And then after uh, six months, it must be marked as missing. So I'm going to go back to Sally's account. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark getting permission as uh, a claim of being returned. OK, it's down here. I'm going to select it. These uh, buttons will open up to be able to be clicked on, make a claim. And I'm going to claim uh, it was returned. Claim. OK, claim successful. And you can see now here, there's a one in the claim section right here. What if the claim, what if the book never ever found? Um, it does have to be marked missing after six months. It automatically happens? or it No, it's it's something, a part of your okay. cleanup process that you would do. Okay. You would run reports and mark it missing. And then missing, of course, has to be withdrawn after six months. So right. that would be a total of a year that you'd have to find the item. But they never have to pay it. Right. Okay. If they wouldn't be responsible in that case. Okay. All right. And then in the... Um, the claims loss tab, you can see now um, there on the 27th, which is today, there's a claim date, um, and it's right here. Uh, and um, you can you can also kind of, um, this is going to be chronological order, so as these um, claims or loss um, numbers tick up and down, they're going to be uh, chronologically in order as the um, everything's updated. Um, next, we're going to declare something lost. And with lost items, there is a big section of the TNP uh, manual. So first, we'll go into there, there lost items. So um, the big thing with lost items is payment. So in terms of accepting payment, cash is not accepted if the item is from another library. And the reason for that is that we don't move cash around in the del inner library delivery system. Um, so when it is not your item, info must be sent to the owning library. Um, you can do a check or money <coughs> order. Um, uh, or they can always, for anything, they can always pay in the, in the pack. Um, you need to get, with a check, um, the patron info, the item info. Um, and then pa the patron gets a copy of the item info that's dated and initialed and marked as paid. So that's kind of their receipt. Uh, the owning library then must either withdraw the item or mark it being repaired. And you do this uh, designation of being repaired as if you're planning to replace it. Um, and you know, in the event that the library accepts payment by accident, you know, like uh, it's paid for, for cash and, and it's um, paid at the li library that doesn't own the item, the owning library then has seven months to request uh, reimbursement from the um, library that made that mistake. So that's kind of the window to, to reconcile everything. Um, refunds. OK, so in terms of refunds, libraries are not required to refund lost payments made by patrons from other libraries. Um, uh, they should contact their own library for that. So I'm going to go back into Sally's account, and we're going to do um, Gold Serpent Thorn as, as lost. OK, it's down here. Declare lost. And this um, window pops up. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to go into this more. But um, what it will do is it will um, come up with the information on um, like how the, that's going to be taken care of. Um, but for now, I'm going to say um, charge and then leave the rest as is. 
Okay, now it's declared lost successfully. So um, there's something we have that are called um, four months bills, and um, these are actually this is really important. So there's a whole long section in PNP on four month bills. Um, what they are is they're a unique process to buckles uh, that allows libraries to reimburse each other for their patrons lost items. So um, if uh, if this one in here, once upon a time, um, isn't paid for by the patron after four months, um, then Hawthorne, whose item, let me open it. Um, you can see it's um, Hawthorne is the owning branch. So then Hawthorne would be able to build uh, South Orange for it. So I'm going to go into that a little bit here in more detail for four month bills. All right, so there's a lot here. Um, first off, uh, in terms of collecting on four-month bills, at the top here, um, libraries should do e make every effort to get items back after the 60-day bills are issued and before the 90-day bills are issued. 90-day um, block. Oh, 90-day blocks, yeah. yeah. Um, so what happens is after 90 days past the due date, the 90-day block is added um, to the items and libraries can refuse to accept them back. Um, Four-month bills should be issued no later than seven months after the due date, otherwise reimbursement is forfeited. So again, you have that seven-month window to, to um, reconcile all the, all the money and items. Um, there's a report that we're going to go over in more detail in reports training, but it's called our lost item four-month bill report. Um, and what this is, is it's a report to issue bills to other library um, patrons with lost items. And um, we have a Buckles bill form. I'll open that real quick, just so you can quickly see it. So this is just a PDF, and it's um, a bill form. The price will be the one listed in the item um, in the item record, or if there isn't uh, a price in the item record. Then we're going to go to our our um, uh, replacement cost policy table, and basically that is um, really by material type. So if there's nothing in the item record, it will say um, uh, by material type. This is kind of what the I have it on the slide. Oh, <coughs> the slide. Oh, okay. That's, yeah. Um, Oh, right here. Gotcha. Sorry. I mean, they all have it in their yeah. handouts, too. But yeah. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, like I was saying, it's by um, kind of material type. So, um, you know, something like a DVD is going to be more, well, you know, you guys get what I'm saying. Um, more expensive items are going to be have a higher replacement cost. Okay, so um, if a library doesn't pay after 45 days, the owning library's director should contact the patrons, uh, the patron library's director. So um, you know that happens from time to time, and then if there's then a disagreement between the two directors, um, then they'd go to Dave and the executive director, and um, you know. If, for um, the resolution on it. Upon payment to the owning library, the patron's library must submit a copy of the bill with the payment check, mark the item as paid on the patron's account, and add a manual fine for the item to the patron's account, and put notes on the patron record explaining the manual fine. After receiving payment, the owning library should mark the item withdrawn, or again, if it's being replaced, mark it as being repaired. Uh, it's really important, and we have a lot of questions about it. Um, the item must be checked in first in order to do both of these things. Uh, in terms of refunds, there are no refunds on four-month bills. So, you know, that was a lot. It, was, um, it's, it confuses me, and um, you know, but once you kind of get through it, um, you know, it, it makes makes sense. It's just kind of our our way we do things. So um, now I'm going to go over to. Um, 
to declaring damage. So in the policy for damaged incomplete or mislinked items, open this up. Um, what you're going to do is you have this handy, I'll make this a little bigger, um, material condition chart. And um, it basically goes from like no damage noted to normal wear and tear all the way down to like not fit for circulation. So, um, you know, it's just kind of, um, uh, it's not really, you know, you've got to be like qualitative, look at it and see, okay, like what do I think? Um, and then it will kind of give some examples um, uh, to run, to go by. So like, you know, with discs, if a DVD or a Blu-ray or video game, if it's scratched but it's still playable, it's um, still usable versus it won't work at all. So this chart is um, uh, very handy. Um, so also I'm going to point out that the patron and ultimately the patron's home library is responsible for reimbursing the owning library for items damaged by the patron. Um, you know, so that's really straightforward um, and how that works. So I'm going to go back to Sally's account and um, the li librarianess. Um, I don't want to search through it, so I'm just going to click. I don't know why that's not filtering, but um, here it's down here. I think each one has library and it's in one of the columns, so it's not helping you at all. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> Let's do a novel. There we go. So I did A and it pulls these up. So <laughs> it's something, yeah, it, you can either look through or you can just filter it up to you. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is with um, this item. So what I'm going to do is um, we're going to put a, a note, like we said, and how that works on on the patron's account explaining the damage. Yeah, we don't have a mark damaged yeah. function, so you have to mark it lost and then explain in a note about the damage. Yeah. Okay, um, so I want to say, um, are you in free text block? Oh, I was in, um, no, a feature like, block. So add block, free text, and I'm going to say, um, Um, and then it's going to be my initials, South Orange, all right, and then that block's added successfully. So next I'm going to go to um, Sally's Out and Overdue tab, and I'm going to show you the um, print list. So. Uh, Remember when you check any of these items individually, it's going to um, uh, bring up these um, buttons to be able to click. But if you select the topmost row, just like with most things, you can select everything at once. Um, and you can go to print list. And um, what this does is it will print a uh, itemized list for the patron of, of everything that's on their account that's out and overdue. Uh, um, as an example here, going back to the question about the space at the end of the receipt, I'm going to take away the footer, and we'll see if that just prints regular size. Yeah, so you can see here, it just printed here and didn't add the empty white space. Okay, um, notification history. So for this, we're going to Margaret's account, I believe. Yes. 
because Margaret Sally doesn't have enough yeah, activity. So, Margaret's a real person. Sally's a made up person. All right. So under Margaret's account, um, he would go to out and overdue stuff. All right. Yep. Um, so back in the out and overdue tab to get um, all the the history of of um, notices here, what you can do is you can select. Um, uh, Any one, so I'm going to do monarchy, and uh, these buttons pop up, and I click notification history, and you can see here that um, it's uh, in chronological order. Um, delivery method is email, and what the notice is is out, um, almost overdue, um, auto renew reminder, and then you can see status email completed. Um, so this gives you a quick um, summary of all the notifications that have to do with that one item on Margaret's account. Uh, and then also, if I want to go into the item record, I can from there. But I'm going to close out of that. So um, that is uh, pretty much it for our out and overdue area. Um, next up, we have account right here. Um, and Will's going to go into it on Sally, I believe. So I'll close this. But then it also sits in like the library. If it's from another library, they don't have to take it back. It just automatically would go. Are we talking about claims? Yeah, or I guess it's, that's only for our own so items. But if we find somebody else's, well, and if I already bought your copy by that point, so. I mean, if somebody checks in something and it's from your library or another library and it's claimed, it'll come off. It'll come off. Um, oh, can, can, can this phone from TMEC says I return this. Can I make a claim to return from TMEC? No, That's no. Right. Yeah. All right. But if they choose not to clean up their claims return and follow policy and there's something still claims returned a year later and somebody returns it, it it'll come off. Yeah. It's supposed to be marked missing after six months, but. Not everyone follows. All right. So um, next up, we have account. And uh, when it comes to the account, there's a few things that just need to be stated. Um, for overdues versus replacement costs, you just want to make sure that um, you're not accepting cash or any partial payments for any replacement costs based on if, you're, um, if it's not your own library's item. So for example, let's say that an item is checked out. Um, and it's not owned by South Orange, you wouldn't be able to get a partial payment or accept cash for that cost. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, when it comes to paying versus waiving fines as well, um, we're going to go over that in a little bit. So um, when it comes to figuring that out, you can look at the overdue fines policy. Um, that'll kind of explain a little bit more how that can be done. I'm just going to close out these tabs real quick. So um, for the overdue fines, there's a few different policies that you're going to look at when it comes to this. First off, you have the fine creation policy. Um, what that explains is that the, um, the fine policy of the owning library prevails over that of the checkout library. So um, it kind of gives a little bit of power towards the patron or towards the item that owns that specific item. Um, next up, you have fine collection. Uh, this policy states that collecting libraries uh, keep the money. Um, when it comes to fines, so keep that in mind as well. Uh, next up, you have fine posting. Um, this states that the fine policy should be posted in a visible place at the circulation desk. That'll be helpful so that um, the patron will be able to see it right there and then when they're trying to do anything at the circulation desk. Um, and it's helpful for staff members if they need a uh, way to remember it. And then lastly, you have fine forgiveness. Um, this states that fine amnesty or waiving fines applies 
um, only to the library's own materials and should be clearly stated. Fine amnesty for staff is based on local policy, but the extension to staff from other libraries is optional. So it's um, really important to just remember that when it comes to forgiving your fines too. Um, so I'm going to go back to Sally and we're going to go ahead and start to pay some of the fines that she has applied onto her account. So if we go ahead and click um, one of the check boxes here, we'll be able to apply. Um, click refresh. Yep. <laughs> There we go. So <laughs> we have an overdue fine we just set up here. So um, if we click the checkbox next to the overdue fine, um, what that does is it's going to do the same thing that Luke was mentioning before, where it'll light up all of these buttons at the top here. Um, once that's done, all you need to do is click the pay button here that's on the left. Um, and this will be used if the patron wants to pay for the item directly in front of you. Um, if they're paying by check, um, you can go into this method here and click the check button and then add um, their check number within the notes field in order to be able to have that information on file with their account. Um, if they want to pay by cash, however, you can also go ahead and click cash. Um, in this case, I'm going to use cash. And um, we're going to go ahead and click the pay button. Once it's done, it'll remove that charge from the account. And you'll notice that the account number here um, reflects the, the removal of the 60 cents. Um, when it comes to adding charges, uh, that's also based on uh, the policy. If you go to the manual fines policy, um, there's two sections that we're going to be looking at. First up, you have the adding manual fines section. Um, this states that only the home library can add manual fines to their patrons' records. Um, if manual fines need to be added for a patron of another library, uh, their library must be contacted first, and manual fines should be accompanied by explanatory notes and preferably the item barcode if there is one. So. That's just really helpful to, in order to make sure that um, all the libraries within the consortium kind of have an understanding that uh, they essentially manage their own patrons in these cases. Um, the next section we have is collecting. And what this policy states that um, you have to note um, that regarding manual fines, uh, they can be removed by the library that collects the manual fine, but they shouldn't be removed if there's only a partial payment that's collected. Um, that's really important to remember. You don't want to remove it completely if it's a partial payment because that means that there's still a payment that needs to be done on the account. And we want to make sure that we have an understanding why that's the case. So if I go back to Sally's account, we're going to actually add a charge. Um, and we're going to talk of, we're going to add a charge for a broken DVD case. Um, so we're going to go ahead and scan this barcode in the item barcode field. Um, from that point, we can go ahead and go to the amount. In this example, we're going to uh, apply $3. So I'm just going to type in 3.00. Um, and then we're going to go to the fee reason, which brings up a drop down of a bunch of different options that we can select from. In this case, the item was damaged. Uh, there's a broken DVD case. So we're going to click damaged item um, as our. You know, you put manual fine. It's always manual fine. Oh, sorry. So you're going to put manual fine in this case, uh, considering the fact that you're manually charging the item at this point. Um, and then you can also use notes um, if you want to add any other information regarding the charge. Um, so with that being said, everything's kind of filled out. You so can put broken DVD case, though. I would, yeah. I would specify what it is. Yeah. So I'm going to type in broken DVD case. And now that that's been entered, we can go ahead and click the Add Charge button. And now it applies it on the patron's account. And you'll again see that this is now reflective of the new charge we just added. Um, next up, we have Account Summary. So this is based on the view. Um, you'll notice here that it's already on Account Summary as we look at it. And it just gives a summary of all of the payments and um, charges that the patron has to pay off. But however, we can click this and it's like a drop down menu that shows a few different options. Um, if we go to transaction summary, um, this is a little bit different. So it shows any of the transactions that Sally has made. Um, so in this case, uh, there was a charge for 60 cents, but she ended up paying it. So there's an amount for 60 cents that shows that it's been paid. Um, what you can also do as well is you can uh, click part particular line items and then press the properties button. What this does is that it gives you more information on that, um, on that uh, transaction. So you have the transaction type and information here. You can look at the item that the transaction was made for. And then you can also look at about to see uh, which staff member actually uh, 
kind of dealt with the payment that the patron was making in this case, or the transaction that the patron was making. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Next up, we're going to talk about credit card payments. So uh, you saw that that was an option when we were looking at payments. Um, you wouldn't do it directly in uh, Leap, and the reason for it is if we go to the policy here, it kind of states how this would be done. So um, if we look at the accepting payment policy, um, it states that patrons can make payments via the pack. So um, this is going to be kind of the standard for what patrons will be able to do when they're using your credit card. Um, money is collected into a Buckles account, and it's reimbursed to the owning library uh, quarterly by a check. There is a $0.50 cents convenience fee for each transaction, but there's no minimum charge required. And for PCI compliance as well, um, library staff may not have contact with patrons' credit slash debit cards, so um, in this case, you'd always have to let the patron know that they have to do it on their own. Um, we don't want to have any contact with it, just to make sure there's, um, just to avoid any security concerns and such. Um, when it comes to refunds as well, if we go scroll down here, it, um, there no refunds can be made for credit or debit card payments as well. Um, when it comes to um, credit cards and debit cards as well, we see a lot of issues of this happen, but there's chances where there will be temporary holds versus charges. So sometimes patrons think that the payment went through on their, their uh, credit card statement um, and the charge is still on their library account. So this usually is a hold on their credit card or debit card and it's not an actual charge. And um, if it's not charged onto their account and it's just a hold, it'll disappear after a few days. If it doesn't go away after a week, however, then you would send the Buckles office a ticket and we can kind of go into our systems to figure out what the issue was there and kind of solve it for you. Um, that being said, um, we're going to go into check-in next, but do you think we should take a break? If you guys want. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Um, it's 11.23 right now, so we'll um, come back at around 11.28 and we'll kind of reconvene from there. I'm gonna go move my car. Oh no! Did we need to call in your license? Oh, either way, I, mean, I don't mind. I, I, um, I'm, I'm a different car now from the white. Yeah, Keisha had taken our information, but I guess he has a new car now. Yeah. yeah. If you move from one stop to another, it's considered the same time. Yeah. Oh, so okay. we need to call them. Okay. Well, you, the you need your license plate. Okay. Mm -hmm. Did I see on the, uh, I don't know where it was now, mm -hmm. where we were paying like a lost item, mm -hmm. a series of drop down boxes where you were charged the lost item, but then maybe, because our policy sometimes will waive the overview fines in lieu of the, the full payment, so we can waive one and pay the other. Exactly, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Anytime you see, we have so many libraries that are going fine free that we don't often have a chance to show it. But anytime you're charging the loss, if you see anything come up in that um, overdue column, mm -hmm. you want to waive it. Um, if it says amount due zero, then you leave it as is. But if it says amount due like $5, then you waive it because you're charging them for the whole price of the item. We're going to actually show um, checking in lost items, and then you'll see how you have to resolve those same boxes when you check it in. Mm -hmm. So it said there's no refunds, but what if, like, a person paid for something, right? But it was our fault. It wasn't actually lost or something. We couldn't find it, but they paid for it. That's your own. I, I believe any time it says no refunds, the understanding is that it's, when you're dealing with another library versus another library's items versus your own items, most things locally you can do mostly what you want. So you can do refunds on your own items, but there's no guarantee that if it's another item, like if your patron comes into you and says, I found this West Orange item that I already paid for, there's no guarantee that West Orange is going to give them a refund. But I think for the most part, on those things, accepting lost items back um, after <clears throat> after the 90 days block and accepting lost items back after they paid for it, all of that is up to you guys for your own items. 
we're now going to go over uh, check-in. So um, we're going to start with uh, PMP for um, check-in. So uh, nothing really here. It's pretty straightforward policy, short and sweet. Items must be checked in at the receiving library before being sent to the owning library or to another library to fill a hole. Okay. Um, so there's a couple different types of check-in. Um, you can see here there's this um, menu at the top. Um, we have normal check-in. We have bulk check-in. We have in-house check-in. We have inventory. So I'm going to go through um, examples of all these. But uh, first, we're going to do normal check-in. All right, and you can see this overdue fine came up for the bungalow mystery. Um, and uh, how normal check-ins work is if there's any um, fines or kind of notices on the item you're checking in, it's going to give you a pop-up right then and there. So normal check-in is really most helpful if um, the patron's in front of you because you can say, like, hey, do you want to... Um, Take care of the dollar twenty cent fine on this, or you know you can um, charge the charge the account. Um, the next thing that comes up a lot, um, and this is very important, is um, a place item in transit pop up window. And now you're always gonna so it's gonna say the item, and it says this item does not belong to this branch. Do you want to put it in transit to close to public library? Um, it's always important to click yes to these because um, uh, always just click yes. It's like rule of thumb. Because um, if you don't, um, we have a unclaimed missing in action policy. So um, you always want to take care when items go in transit as the last library to check in the item is the responsible party. So if I had, uh, you know, I checked that in and it said, do you want to put it in transit? If I just had said hit no, then the book got put under the desk. Um, eventually, you're going to get billed for it if it, you know, doesn't turn up. So by always putting it in transit, especially with a consortium with 78 libraries, items are um, being transferred all the time. So um, it's really important to keep in mind um, because you know the, the owning library will issue that four-month bill, um, and there's no refunds. So um, uh, let's see next. We're going to go over another check-in. OK, transfer for hold. So um, you'll see this also a lot. Uh, the first example was for an item that was checked in, but doesn't belong to South Arm, so it was going to go on to Cloister. And this one, um, it's going to fulfill a hold request. So um, it says the item fills the request at West Orange. Um, do you want to transfer it? <coughs> um, so you can say um, yes, um, but it also says click cancel to stop the check-in check-out process. So um, uh, there are times where you would um, do this. I'm going to go into the policy and under. Um, this one, this one, you can click yes, uh, continue. But oh. the next one. Oh, the next one. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now that's going to go on to the patron at uh, West Orange. Yeah, this is, sorry, this was the example. Um, this now says uh, the third example, fill hold request. Um, it holds, fulfills a hold request for Shirley. Um, do you want to hold the item? So what I was just saying with the click cancel to stop the um, process, um, I'm going to go over when you would uh, decline this hold request. So um, back to the policy under requests. Um, so in this example, it's saying, you know, okay, it's going to fill a request. But when you check it in, um, it might be like, say, heavily damaged, or for whatever reason, you think the item should go back to the owning library before filling any more holds. What you want to do there is decline it, and then you want to reactivate, which is really important, the request. Um, so then that patron can still get the item. It's just going to be a different copy. Um, so it's really important if you cancel that process there because the item is showing up at 
check and totally damaged, right? You're not going to keep sending it. You want to cancel it, get that back to the owning library, but then reactivate the old request. Just be clear when you're your terminology, it's not cancel. You're actually clicking no. Cancel would cancel oh, the check in right. entirely. No says you're not going to fill the hold. You're going to let it go on to the next item. You're going to reactivate the hold. So you would click yes next. Right. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, do you want to reactivate? Yes. Um, Continue. And then so we can have an example for our use. <laughs> Yes, you can click continue with fines if you don't want to deal with it then and there, but you will be prompted to deal with it later, which I'll show you. Yeah, we'll with a uh, bulk check-in. No, with with the resolved charges, but you'll get there. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so, so now I need to go into the item record um, for the damaged item. So it was... Um, uh, 373, it was this one here. Um, so I'm going to go into the item record. And now I'm going to make a note um, about the damage. So um, let's see. Oh, are you in the blocks and notes tab? I'm just getting the item. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Okay, and we're going to say damage at check-in. And your initials, the library, and the date. All right, so now there's um, an item block there. So now when it gets back to the old library, it's going to pop up and they're going to see that this was damaged uh, before we got it and they need to deal with it. Next up, we have a pop-up uh, item block for contents. We will kind of um, went over this at uh, checkout. Um, so you can also set it up for like, you know, upon check-in. Um, this is a, this, the item getting permission we talked about um, that there's a disk included. So just like you need to make sure it's in there when it goes out, make sure it comes back with the disk. So I'm going to check the contents. You know, it has everything there. Hit continue, and we'll take care of that. Um, can, I, can I ask something that we might cover in a different part, but as far as the process, when you're checking in, to go to another library for a hold, do you have to, you just put it into like a bin, or do we have to do any kind of um, There's going to be a special slip that prints out okay. that you'll put in the item, and then um, you'll have separate bins for each route. Okay, um, there's going to be delivery training on that. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's upcoming. Okay. Yeah, I guess my question, <coughs> how it differs from like the ILL process is that, what just happened? There's only. No, nothing. There's only directs from, we request a book, we send it back. They send it to the next library. Is it like more like a chain where it's like, we get a book from West Orange, we use the book, it comes back in. If, let's say, East Orange, and probably, let's say there's like another library is waiting for it afterwards, we don't send it back to West Orange, we send it on to the right. next library. The, the slip chain. is going to tell you where to send it. Oh, okay, okay. And I don't know that they, the slips have been printing so far, Yeah. but um, you'll see... When he did earlier, he did an in transit, it popped up. Right. That would be accompanied by a slip, which would tell me the next library. I don't know if it printed out for you, Bill, but um, or it would tell, the next library it would tell you the next library to send it to. And when there's a hold, it will actually tell you where to send it for the hold. It won't be the owning library, and it'll say loan requests at the top in black. So it'll be very obvious that it's for a hold. Okay. To Chinac, to whoever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, because that's how how it differs from the ILL process where yeah, we you, you always send it to the, always send it back to the home library. Yeah, and they would send. Now it back. it's going to be different, and the stuff okay. is going to tell you where to send it. Okay. Yep. Just one that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
Next, we're going to check in a previously lost item, I believe. OK, so uh, this item uh, was lost. Um, and you'll see it says resolve lost item. So before 90 days, it's OK to accept it back regardless of um, the owning library. Oh, um, so we're going to waive replacement. And then we're going to charge the overdue. See, this is, Michael, you were asking about that. Um, this is where you do have to be careful to select the correct yeah. box. And, and you do want to charge the overdue because they now found the lost item and they should be responsible for those overdues. Um, and then another place item in transit pops up. Say yes. Yeah, see, that's and where a slip should be coming up. But I'm guessing our settings are not. Let me do a uh, check in. Yeah, here it is. So you see a uh, check in right here? Nothing's checked. So um, that's why. Okay. OK. All right, so we'll have uh, a couple examples still to go. All right. So now um, do another. Uh, OK, so we just went over one before 90 days. Um, now this says item is blocked um, because it's 90 days overdue. So going back to the. Um, PNP for the four month bill, um, it's, let's just find it here. Um, and then collecting on four month bill, um, libraries, like we talked about, may refuse to accept items back returned after 90 days. So it's really up to their discretion. So on here, what I would do is instead of hitting continue, I'd say cancel. And then I'd call the owning library and ask if they'll accept it back and go from there. Um, next, we're going to go over another example. OK, so this is an example of an unpaid lost item one year after due date. Um, so in the PMP for lost items, lost items must be removed from the patron's card 12 months after their due date and withdrawn or replaced. So here, um, We're pretending this is a South Orange item. Yeah. I didn't have a, a South Orange item as an example because you guys don't have items in the system that are lost for 12 months yet. But I had to use an item as an example. So pretend it's South yeah. Orange. We would never do this for another library's item, but just pretend it's South yeah. Orange. All right, we're still having uh, printer issues, but. Um, I'm sorry, I had a bad example here. I guess um, the training server was updated or something because that should have popped up. Um, basically, just go through the, um, can you go yeah. back to the policy and go through the steps? Yep. So um, in this example, in the policy, what would happen here? Um, for if it's your item and it's unpaid and it's lost after the due date, remember, um, they must be removed from the patron's card 12 months after due date and withdrawn or replaced. Um, so what you would do here is the window would pop up and you'd say leave replacement cost as is and then charge the overdues. Um, now this seems really counterintuitive because it's like double jeopardy. You can't get charged overdues and like a replacement. Um, but how, how It'll make sense in a minute. Yeah, so how you do it is um, you go into the item record. You know what? Let's just use that other one as an example, the one that the other 90 day block, so we can actually show them. Um, the bungalow mystery? The, the after 90 days one here that ends with 2673. Okay. This one here, right? Yeah. Just so we can show, well, check it in. Check it in. Um, oh wait, hold on. Yeah, just scan it on your on your paper. Okay. 
Yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. So um, before we had canceled and you know called the owning library, but in this case we're going to say continue. So now this is going to pop up for the um, example. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to um, leave the replacement cost as is, and then on under um, the overdues, uh, leave as is as well. You were, okay. So this so is what it's counterintuitive, but it would. No, it's it's our, it's a bad example. Sorry, I I didn't come as prepared as I should have. Um, that. The, basically, if there were overdue fees here, you would charge them. And it seems counterintuitive, but the point is that you're going to waive them and you're going to leave an explanatory note that you're only doing this because you're trying to clear your unpaid lost item. Yeah. Um, but you cannot leave a note in this screen when you waive something. There's no notes field. So you have to charge it and then you have to waive it later on with a note. Yeah. So yeah, you would go to the item record, you would click on the last borrower. Let's borrow it here. And you would go to the overdue fines if there were any, which of course, unfortunately there aren't, but you would take that overdue fine, you would you would select waive, and then you would add, add a note as per the policy, which you have in front of you, and he has on the screen. Um, item has been lost more than 10 months, waiving overdue fines from withdrawing item. It's and literally like spelled out in the policy what you're supposed to type, yeah. include your library code and your staff initials, and you're done. So and, that's and for unpaid lost items. And the reason for that is you can't withdraw, right? With you, a you can't put a note in that other screen yeah. when you waive. So you shouldn't waive it in the other screen. You should charge it and then waive it later so you can add, excuse me, add that note. It's I would go over the steps in the policy um, about lost items, unpaid lost items, just to refresh your memory because it is you, you just yeah. want to like follow them. Yeah, it's there's a there's this whole list there. It. Yeah. Yeah, that whole piece there. Okay. Um, next we're gonna cover uh, checking in damaged, incomplete, or mislinked items. So um, in this part, for uh, Damaged items. Um, we're again, again, there's going to be either it's going to be already noted or it's going to be not already noted. Um, so I'm going to close out of this. Close, and we're going to do uh, remember this garden of small beginnings. Um, item is blocked. Uh, and Margaret put a note in here that the binding is loose. So it's already noted. I'm looking at it. Binding is still loose. No change. It's not further damage. And we can say continue. And the check is successful. But now we're going to do um, one that's not already noted. Um, well, I guess it looks like we did note it. <laughs> yeah. OK. But um, what you do here is if it's not already noted or if it's like further damage, you go to the um, material condition chart that we showed you earlier, um, and then add the free text block with a library code, date, and staff initials. Um, but and then the okay, so we can add, like, pretend it's more damage. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We're add. Um. Okay. And then if the damage is uh, serious, just contact the only library for next steps um, on what to do. They might want to choose to hold the patron responsible. So for uh, mislinked items, um, 
So it says, do you want to transfer this for the hold? Um, and we're going to look at it and say it's mislinked. Um, these must be sent back to the owning library. So what you're going to do, just like we did in the other example, is we'll say no. Um, and then we always want to reactivate that hold. Continue. And again, it's a, you know, because we're doing normal check-in, so any finer on the item is going to come up as you scan them in. All right, so now that went back um, to be checked out. Um, the other thing we have to do with a mislinked item is not only send it back to the owning library, but there's also a form we fill out called the uh, mislink form. Um, it's free text block first. Oh, right. I'm going to ask a question. And if it's a stupid question, I might have missed the training. What do you mean by mislinked item? Um, so it's attached to the wrong bibliographic wrong. Okay. record. Yeah. And, and like a yeah. duh answer, but yeah. I just want to be and sure. And you that's caught what it, it, and you want to alert right. the okay. owning library. I just wanted to be sure that that's what that yeah. was. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do a free text block. Initials, library, date. OK, so now we go the, um, to this mislinked form. And it is under. this. <clears throat> um, and then this is going to be the first thing with the support form is you're going to do the like the general category and it's going to be catalog. Um, and then next and it's going to be mislinked item. All right, and then what I'll do here is just um, copy and paste the barcode. And the title. Just grab the other. And the library was Bergenfield. Uh, this volume, if applicable. And then it says violation of policy. Is this item linked in violation of Bullock's policy? Buckle's policy, for instance, is item linked individually when it should be part of a larger set. Example, TV series, CDs, et cetera. Uh, I'll say no. Next. And then you can put in um, a description. And now somebody's actually going to get this. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. I probably should have hit cement, but I realized that afterwards. Oh, well. Um, OK. Yeah, Amanda got one uh, at Carl Sapp, and she texted me. Um, did you send me a mislink alert form? And I'm like, no. It was probably Luke or Will. Well, he's got to read Will's email, right? <laughs> it is. Yeah, it's OK. Yeah, record <laughs> under William. Oh, OK. So I think it's me. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. Um, just so you know, you guys may start getting those once your collection goes live. I did notice when I imported the DVDs that there are some discs that are linked separately within the bib record, and they are going to have to be combined under one barcode. OK. Um, so we are running up against noon, so I'm going to try to go through this last part quickly. Um, we need to start 15 minutes late, too. So we're now under, um, we have all our items checked in, right? And this is what Margaret was mentioning. It now says resolve charges. So um, you you can't close check-in. You see the check-in is um, right here until um, all of this is resolved. So if I click resolve charges, uh, it will say patron name, barcode, new finds, old finds. Um, is it zoomed in too much? Or? Is yeah. Just me? So yeah, a lot of times you would you would want to go to manage all finds at that point, um, and just look at their whole record. 
but if they just want to clear what just came in, you can you can pay them on the yep. spot or you can charge them to their account if they've already walked away. Okay, so next up, um, we went over a check-in for normal, and you saw every time you did a check-in, it'll say like, hey, there's a fine here, there's a fine. So that's kind of like slow and tedious, so especially with something like the book drop, if the um, patron isn't in front of you, and you just have a whole pile, that's when you're going to want to do bulk check-in. And what bulk check-in will do is it will skip that pop-up and automatically just put the um, charges on the account. So um, it's used for book drops, or anytime you have a large amount of items to check in, and the patron isn't there, and so then you'll just charge all potential fines uh, automatically, and it's a lot faster. Um, one quick thing with check in and book drop at, with PMP is um, all um, items left in the book drop, including uh, media, must be checked in. Um, we have something called free days. So what that does is this accounts for, um, in bulk check-in, uh, days that the library is closed. So say it's um, a holiday weekend, uh, the library is closed on Monday and Sunday, then you would do two free days, and it would um, uh, give everyone that's checked items in those free days. OK, so next up, um, you always need to set free days before um, checking in. So um, if you start checking them in, you can't then retroactively go back and set uh, free days. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Does Buckles automatically like, lock out major holidays? So no. Uh, well, OK. Not for check-in, but things won't be due on holidays that you're closed. And we've already entered South Orange's closed dates that you've given us. So nothing will come up due on those dates. So you don't, like, you still need to do do the count back, and if you were closed for three days, you want to put in three free days just so that it catches the correct date on check-in. But um, they wouldn't have been charged for those fines anyway. So it's better to just count however many days you were closed either way. Yeah. So I'm going to do an example of uh, both check-in where a fine window normally would pop up, and it automatically goes to place it in transit. transit. Um, so we do yes. Um, and you can see here, um, the it would put like fine charge here, and then it would also um, um, see that it says due date is uh, 920, um, and today is the 27th. What we did is we went back to the 24th um, with those three free days. Um, so that's how that works. Yeah, so there's now, one thing that you can, did you point out the column that shows the fines? Yeah. Fine charged, yep. Uh, one thing I'll point out with bulk check-in is um, some libraries like prefer to use it and use it all the time. Uh, Fairlawn told us they only use bulk check-in because um, it's just more uh, efficient. But you know, it's up to you with the differences. All right, so next um, we're going to quickly cover, cover these last two because we're running out of time. Um, In-house is just really straightforward. It's if you do any in-house checkouts where items don't leave the property, the library, um, like reference materials or magazines, um, you can do an in-house checkout. The patron can go and you know read it in the library and then bring it back. Um, and then next we have inventory. Uh, inventory is just what it sounds like for taking inventory. And what it will do is um, when you scan an item, check in for inventory, it will put a um, inventory date in the item record. So then you can run a report. Um, like afterwards and about inventory items and it, um, it will look for them. The in items that were not inventoried, right? So you can say anything before this date and it will um, help you go through inventory. So that's it um, for check-in. Um, next, uh, real quick, we just have a, one thing to show you on double delivery slip generator, which is uh, something Will's going to cover. Okay, so I'm just going to close out of this. Um, so the last thing, like we've mentioned, is the Buckles Delivery Slip Generator. Uh, this is a custom function that we've kind of included within Leap. Um, and the way to access this is if you go to the Utilities drop-down menu right here, it brings up a few things, and it shows the Buckles Delivery Slip Generator. 
Um, you can also use this keyboard shortcut if you just want to get to it really quickly. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click this, and you'll notice here that a new pop-up shows up. So this is something that we created internally within Buckle so it can match our delivery system a little bit better. And um, there's a few different things that you can do with it. First off, you'll notice that there's this little drop-down menu that says, please select a delivery slip type. And there's the three different delivery slip types that you can use, but mainly you guys are going to use two. Uh, first up is interlibrary mail. What this does is that um, it essentially is used for things that are not in your library collection. If you want to send it to another library, you can do that. So like an example is if you have any posters or bookmarks or brochures that you want to send to a different library, you would use this option or this type to kind of use that. Um, next up, you have the special item transit. This is where you're going to be using that to create specific slips for any materials that you have in your library or anything that's part of your collection. And you'll notice here that it changes as soon as I change the type. So for interlibrary mail, you just have this field, which is the attention field, and then the note, and I'll kind of go over that in a little bit. And then special item transit, which shows new, newer fields here. So um, the third one, it doesn't show up here. That's something that's used internally within Buckles. Um, it's going to say world language subscription. So if you do see that, don't worry about it. Um, so just to kind of go over everything, we're going to stick to the special item transit so we can show everything. First off, you have this drop down menu that shows sender. It's always going to default to South Orange, considering the fact that the account is linked to a South Orange um, library. And then you have your destination, which is where you're going to send the actual item to. Um, it shows all of the different branches that we have available at Buckles. Um, so if, for example, if you wanted to send a specific item to West Orange, you would just scroll down and then click West Orange, and that would be your destination. Um, in terms of the next few fields, you have the ISBN slash UPC and then the item barcode field. This is where you can be able to input that information for any particular material when you're sending it to the uh, to the library. And then lastly, you have attention and note. Attention is just a field that you can utilize to specifically send it to somebody. So let's say, for example, the head of circulation at West Orange needs a book. Um, you can just type in head of circulation for West Orange. and then add any other extra information that you would need to in the notes field just to let them know why you're sending it to them or what the, the purpose for it is. Um, the same thing goes for interlibrary mail as well. The only difference is that um, it'll remove the ISBN slash UPC and the, um, the item barcode field because it's not an item within your collection, so it can just be any brochure. So in this case, if we were going to send it to, for example, the director of West Orange and we're sending in brochures to them, we can say um, in the notes field, brochures for our upcoming event. And um, from that point, they'll have all that information there. So once they receive the slip and once we generate it, it'll show all of that information. I'm going to go ahead and click generate slip um, just to show that. I had a feeling uh, there's an error going on right now. But essentially what the slip is going to look like when you print it, when you generate it, is it's going to look similar to the slips that we just printed out before. And um, if we were able to see the entrance and slips, it'll also show the same information as well. So it'll show uh, based on the root and stop number for um, kind of internally what we set up for every library. It'll show uh, South Orange's number as the sender, and then the destination being uh, West Orange's number. Why is it having an error? Is it because of the browser? Maybe. I'm not 100% sure why it's. Maybe we're doing Firefox. Yeah, if, if you're in Firefox, maybe it'll work. Yeah, let's see if I can just do it really quickly. So for all slip related things, we should use Firefox. We actually recommend Firefox in general for Le for using Leap. For Leap. Just yeah. as okay. a rule. So uh, yeah, we need to um, fix your icons on these computers to be Firefox. Mm -hmm. We use <laughs> But email and I'll do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's only leap that we recommend that. So let's try this. I'm gonna do interlibrary. Uh, we'll do South Orange again, or West Orange again. Sorry, for the destination uh, director of West Orange uh, brochures for upcoming events, and then if we click generate slip, 
Mm. That doesn't okay, happen. we have the... the uh, yeah, we have to look into this to see where that's happening. Wait, go into production. Is it working in production? Oh, maybe. Because if it's not, we, we need to know. <laughs> yeah. That we need to know. I'm just going to use my account. Yeah, if it's working, it's working. So it yeah. doesn't matter which account we're in. shouldn't. Uh, so this is where it's showing that because my account's a little bit yeah, different. Yeah, because you have access to that. You're a little bit yeah. higher up there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then if I click it, there we go. So I don't know why it's doing that. But that's what the, the interlibrary loan um, mail slip looks like. And you'll see that as well when you're checking in any items and it says, do you want to place it in transit? This is the slip that would come up. Um, you would print it out of your receipt printer and then you would put that slip within books. But in this case for um, uh, the interlibrary mail, when you're just sending brochures, you would also print it out in this way and it gives you a bunch of information here. So um, like we were saying before, uh, it shows it's coming from, in this case, the test branch to West Orange. It shows the attention, so director of West Orange, and then it shows the note saying that it's brochures for upcoming events. So they'll have all of that information available to them. And um, once we print it out, we can just add it to the package that we're going to be sending over. And you would just want to adjust your settings in Firefox um, as well for printing receipts. Yeah. With the margins and the backgrounds and the headers and footers and such. Mm -hmm. um, so if it doesn't work, Again, you might just need to pull the computer and then refreeze it for it to take effect. Yeah. Um, and you'll, as you can see, Firefox is slightly different. You just have fields here that you can kind of fill in. And then um, also you want to make sure you check off the, the headers and footers option as well to make sure and that... Uncheck the headers and footers. Yeah, uncheck, but sorry. But you print the backgrounds, yes. Yeah. So that, that way it'll be able to show up. Um, I think... This was zero, and the sides were 0.15, right? Yep. It looks a lot better once you do that. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> squished. And then once you print it out, um, I guess I can print it out now. It'll give you the correct size, and you know, it has all like that information. Cuts it off right after the text. It yeah. Is it going in the book or on the book? In. Mm -hmm. Yep. Tucked in. You get yeah. situations where you have to get a little creative with using slips, like you get the um, paperback books that are really flimsy, like I've seen people paper clip the slip to the front of the, the book, um, DVDs where it's like a box set and the, you can't like slide it in the top, so they slide it in the side and they like rubber band it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they just have to be scanned, I'm guessing, from our, maybe are we going to cover that in a different Delivery session? training yeah, will cover so more like about paper. that, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But basically, all of this that we're talking about now um, is going to start, you'll probably do an email, but it's going to start October 2nd instead of October 1st, um, where you'll be checking out, checking in, doing all this stuff um, in Polaris as well as TLC. So the main thing to remember with all of this is that your collection's in storage, so you're going to need to check everything in before you check it out. And then as items come back, um, you can put them back in storage, you know, maybe once a day or something like that, um, just to keep up with that. But the next training, excuse me, the next training we're going to do um, won't be, you won't start yet the holds training. So you'll learn about it, but you won't start that yet in Polaris uh, until you actually really go live. Well, next training is on Friday? Friday, yep. Mm -hmm. So how do we reactivate the hold? By clicking, um, once you've clicked no to fill it, mm -hmm. you click yes next to reactivate it. And it will literally ask you, if you read the screen, you'll see, do you want to reactivate the hold for this patron? And you'll click yes. Mm -hmm. I would say in most cases, you're going to just fill the hold. But every once in a while, you know, something's, for example, too damaged. Yeah. And then you're going to define it. Or in the case cells. Um, somebody finds something on your shelf that had a pending hold, you're going to give it to the patron who found it on the shelf first. You're not going to say, oh, I'm sorry, this has a hold on it. Because, you know, they found it on the shelf. Yeah. 
I'm so, sorry, you said so after you say no that to the to the first to screen one. saying do you want yes. to hold it yes then so it'll say yes to do you want to reactivate to hold. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I believe that's pretty much it for this session. I'm just going to stop the recording actually. <laughs>